him. And as we have been think, sung there, in all the changing scenes of life, whatever they might be, still we know that the Lord is the one who is with us and the one who is able to sustain us, to keep us whatever may come. So we're going to buy in the presence, and we're going to read from the, the, the book of Hosea in the Old Testament. I had been going to resume um, the study that we've been having prior to Christmas in the book of Titus, but really I just felt there was a burden on my heart that there was something else that I should bring this morning. So we're turning to Hosea, and we're going to read just, we'll just read one verse in chapter 13, then we'll read all of chapter 14, Hosea and chapter 13, and we read from just one verse, and it's verse 9, Hosea chapter 13 and the ninth verse, and we read these words, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. And then chapter 14, O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words and turn to the Lord. Say unto him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. So will we render the calves of our lips. I sure shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses, neither we will look any more to the work of our hands. Ye are our God's for in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from them. I will be as the Jew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily, and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. His branches shall spread, and his beauty shall be as the olive tree, and his smell as Lebanon. They, shall dwell under, they that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, What have I to do any more with idols? I have heard him and observed him. I am like a green fir tree from me. Is thy fruit found? Who is wise? And he shall understand these things. Prudent and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. And the just shall walk in them. But the transgressors shall fall therein. Amen. This is the word of God. May he bless it to all of our hearts this morning. We live in truly dreadful days. I've said uh, previous occasions that they are, these are unprecedented days, but they are truly dreadful days. And these are days in which I really believe from my heart there is the need of a prophetic voice, not a pathetic voice, a prophetic voice. And by a prophetic voice, I do not mean the voices of those who claim nowadays to be prophets. And you can hear them so often on the different media. And they'll come and say that they have this fresh word from the Lord. They have this new message that is from the Lord. And they will make these prophecies and their predictions. It wasn't so long ago that there was a man who said that he had banished COVID from the United States of America in the name of the Lord. That was back about March time. Of course, these men are able just to bury that and go on and make more of their false prophecies. False prophets. Don't listen to them. And there's some pretty close at home as well. It's not that sort of thing we need. We have God's finished book here. It's that that we need to look to. But then you see, there are other prophetic ones. And they will come to this book. But they'll want you to engage in speculation and abstruse things in Ezekiel, perhaps, or the book of the Revelation, or portions of Daniel. And they've got all of this prophecy worked out. And you can see much of that. But listen, steer clear of it. And see all of this talk about the inoculation, the mark of the beast, and all the rest of it. I'm just going to be blunt. It's rubbish. It's garbage. I don't want to be going down at an angle and off at a tangent in this. But when anybody comes off with that to you, you say to them, if the mark of the beast is an inoculation, then what does the mark of the people of God have in the book of their revelation? And you repeat it again and again. The mark on their forehead. What is that? 
Is that an inoculation? You need to be consistent. This isn't the sort of prophetic voice that we need. The prophetic voice is the voice that comes to the Word of God, that which He has already revealed. And by wisdom and insight that is imparted by God, He is enabled in the power of the Holy Spirit to apply the truth of God relevantly to the needs and the sins of the specific age in which we live. And I say to you, I do not hear a voice like that in these days. And I'm not uh, complaining. I'm not claiming to be that voice. I don't believe I am. Otherwise, I would make a greater impact than I do with the power of the Holy Spirit. But yet I want to bring a message that I think needs to be applied in these days and needs to be applied so much in our own land, in our own nation, in our churches, and even individually. And here is the text. I want to take it from uh, uh, Hosea chapter 13 and from the version that I'm reading from. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thy help. And this is worthy of three applications. Now, the the true interpretation is, as it related to Israel, we'll think about them in a moment or two. But it can be applied in three distinct areas. It can be uh, applied nationally. And we could say today, O Britain, O Ulster, O Ireland, you have destroyed yourself. But in me is your hope, says the Lord. But there are churches and church groupings, and they need to take stock. And they could save themselves, and I'll not name any names. But when you get churches that are tolerating homosexuality, and will have their ministers who are homosexual and practicing homosexuals ordained, and are trying to accommodate all sorts of other transgenderism and so on within their ranks. It's high time that they were looking and saying about themselves, you have destroyed yourself, but in the Lord is your help. But you know, maybe individuals need to look into their own hearts and put their own name in there where the Israel is. Those who are the Lord's own, who know him, You can engage in activities that bring about, as it were, a sort of destruction. But yet, thank God, there is help for you. And what of the unsaved? Who in our land are going on a course of self-destruction. But there is help for them in the Lord. So let's think about this wonderful text. Now, whenever it talks about Israel, I need to explain something because... Way before Hosea's time, the people of Israel were a united nation. And they had had um, Saul as a king, David as a king, Solomon as a king. But after the reign of King Solomon, that nation was rent into two parts. The smaller segment they had as their capital, uh, Jerusalem, and they got the name Judah. And whenever you read in the Old Testament of Israel and Judah in juxtaposition beside one another, you realize it's talking about a divided kingdom. Judah is what we call the southern kingdom, the smaller portion, with Judah as with Jerusalem as its capital. But the ten tribes that comprise the larger kingdom, they're the northern kingdom. And they got the name Israel. But at times, and here specifically in the book of Hosea, they were also called Ephraim because the largest tribe among them were the tribe of Ephraim. So as you read about Israel here, it's talking about that northern kingdom, the ten tribes that have Samaria as their capital. When you read about Ephraim and Hosea, it's referring to the same company. So here he's speaking to this northern kingdom and he's saying, oh, you have destroyed yourself. Now, I want you to consider the tragedy of this condition. 
Because if they've been destroyed, that indicates that they had known better times. There were better things that they had known and experienced than they were currently experiencing. And how true this is, I say again, of our nation, our province, of so many of our churches, individuals themselves, they can look back and say there were better times than these are. And you see, these people, they had experienced God's deliverance. That is alluded to there in this very chapter in the fourth verse when the Lord says, Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt. And he reminds them, I'm the one who delivered you. I brought you out of Egypt. Already in the 11th chapter, he has said to them, When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. I brought you out of bondage and darkness. And I liberated you. I give you a glorious deliverance. Now, I do not equate Britain or Ulster with Israel or with the people of God in that sense. But yet we have to look at our history as a nation and acknowledge that God has given us such deliverances, wonderful, mighty deliverances, that so often were inexplicable in human terms. But God brought great deliverance. And in particular, out of the awful spiritual darkness that prevailed over this whole nation for so many centuries, and then God blessed it with the light of the Reformation, but yet so many times since they've gone into spiritual darkness, but God has visited with revival and revival and revival and turned back the darkness and delivered us from it to such a large degree. And yet, intent in destroying ourselves. And what of individuals, what of churches? Oh, how the Lord in his mercy has delivered us. Delivered us from the Egypt of sin delivered us from the doom that was before us. And we have known so many blessings. They had experienced God's deliverance. They had enjoyed God's goodness. And God had been so very good to them. He says to them there in verse 4 of chapter 13, Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt. Thou shalt know no God for me, for there is no Savior beside me. I did know thee in the wilderness, in the land of great drought. And he said, When you're in that wilderness... And you're in that place of great doubt. I cared for you. I looked after you. I helped you all along the way. He used a beautiful imagery for this earlier in the book in chapter 11. Again, he says in verse 1, When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. And then he says in verse 3, I taught Ephraim also to go, taking them by their arms, but they knew not that I healed them. And he says, I was like a father who tenderly took the hands of my little child and guided along and cared for it so tenderly. And my, he says, you know, you have enjoyed God's goodness. And how our nation and this province enjoyed for generations so much of the Lord's goodness. And whenever you saw so many other lands, so many other nations, and the states that they were in, and the darkness that shrouded them. And yet God had been so good, and he showed such kindness, and he showed such mercies upon this nation. And oh, we look back at a God who was so good. And personally, individually, can we not look back and see how good God has been to us? No wonder we sing at times, how good is the God we adore. And he is good and he has been good. But not only that, these people, they had received God's word. Listen to what he tells us there again in chapter 12 of Hosea. He says, I have also spoken by the prophets and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. And here you see is this people and they had the prophetic ministry among them. And again, I want you to picture this, that little portion there that was a relatively small country 
compared to the rest of the world. Yet for generations and generations and generations, the rest of the world was in utter darkness with regard to the Word of God and the things of God. But yet this people, they had God's own sovereignly appointed and ordained messengers who brought to them the very Word of the living God. And the way of salvation was made known to them. The plan of God's redemption and way of forgiveness of sin was theirs. And they were so highly privileged to have received this word. And again, again, you have to look and see this nation and how for so many generations they have been blessed with having the word of God, of having received it and heard it. And not only that, having had the greatest preachers of the Word of God that have ever lived populating our shores. You know that I read much of church history. And I've been reading through a tremendous book. It's a huge volume. Gillies' Accounts of Historical Revivals. And I was reading through it just the other evening, and it came to a segment about even this province... And he began to name preachers who were preaching the word of God and being mightily used years ago. And he went over a list of men and they were spiritual giants. And I had to cry in my heart, Lord, where are the giants now? We are a race of pygmies, spiritually. My, what it was to have the Bible. And where the Bible was cherished, the Bible was prized, the Bible was known. You read novels from back into the 19th century and even the early part of the 20th century, written by some of the famous English authors. And you will read in many of those novels clear allusions to Scripture, imagery from the Bible. And none of it had to be explained to the readers. The readers knew what they were talking about. I tell you, you put those novels into the hands of many Christians nowadays and get them to read them and ask them, did you see anything of the Bible in there? And you know what? I guarantee they'll look at you blankly and say, I didn't see it. Because they're not familiar with it to see it there. You see, they'd had God's word and they'd received God's provision. He says there again, chapter 13, verse 5. I did know thee in the wilderness in the land of great drought. According to their pastures, so were they filled. They were filled and their heart was exalted. Therefore, they forgotten me. And they were filled with God's provision. He provided for them so, so abundantly. And I say again, nation and people, has it not been so? You think of the abundance that our nation has had. You think of the abundance that has squandered, the good things that there have been. And you think of ourselves, those who are listening to me now. My, we have an absolute abundance. And yet so many complain that they do not have enough. And all you see here is this Sad picture. They had known better days, but they've destroyed themselves. Quickly, I want you to notice then the description, the description is given in, the, in this book about this destruction. How was it seen? Uh, what form did it take? I don't have time to deal with this in detail. I'm just going to headline it, as it were. You discover that they were destroyed, first of all, economically, materially. Way back in the early chapters, God speaks and likens his relationship to Ephraim, to Israel, as that of a man who has been married to a woman who is actually a prostitute. And then she goes off with other men. And he says, that's how you have behaved towards me. And he says this to them. He says, you did not know, chapter 2, verse 8, that I gave her corn and wine and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. He says, I give you all of these good things, and you went 
to spend them on your gods, your false gods. He says, therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof and my wine in the season thereof and will recover my wool and my flesh given to cover her nakedness. And he says, I've given you so many blessings. You've spurned them. I will come and I will take those blessings from you. Listen, we are living in days and we are going through days where there is being stored up for us Days of great hardship and difficulty. Unless something dramatic intervenes. Do you really think that our country that had to bring through the people through years of what they called austerity, which was a misnomer. But even so, they trumpeted that. They had to bring you through all of that. And do you really think that they can pour out the billions that they've had to pour out over this past 10 months alone? And much of it wasted. And the billions that are still to be poured out. And where they are in debt to their ears. To who? This is the question I would like answered. Who is it lends the countries all the money? Where does it come from? But in debt for years to come. Once a mighty nation. Renowned through all of the world. None like it. And I soon will be going groveling with a begging bowl. I know there are people who have got used to so much. And in the months and the years to come, they might see a major change in their condition. And you know, God told these people, you've destroyed yourself. You've destroyed yourself. You've destroyed yourself also morally. You look at chapter 4. You think that this was written just yesterday. Hosea in chapter 4. It's so up to date. He says this. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committed adultery, they break out and blood toucheth blood. My, there are five heinous sins. And yet many of them have become so acceptable in our own land and generation. Swearing. That is swearing and taking the name of the Lord in the wrong fashion. Blaspheming it. And it's done ad nauseum. And it can come onto our radio stations and TVs at any time of the day or night and nobody blinks an eyelid. And people can say whatever they like, whatever they want, no matter how dreadful it is about our God and about his Son. And it is all totally acceptable. Lying? Lying, tell me. Is there anybody that you can believe in these days? I'm reminded of Herbie Johnson, a man that some of you people will remember, younger folk will remember, an old man who came years ago. And he used to tell me about two brothers that he knew. And every time he said, Harry, wait till I tell you, one of them couldn't tell the truth and the other one wouldn't tell the truth. And that seems to be how it is. And it just seems to be taken for granted that people will lie. Just taken for granted that politicians tell lies. No sense of integrity anymore. And it fills the land. And then there's stealing. And people steal and steal and steal. And they have such subtle ways of doing it. And they're able to find the techniques to be able to line their own nest by defrauding others and taking from others. And listen, you've got lotteries and lotteries and lotteries. I hardly ever go into a shop locally, but there isn't somebody either in front of me or behind me coming to buy their lottery tickets. Every lottery ticket is an act of theft. You're stealing off some other poor person to line your pockets. And what has happened in our land, churches have gone to lottery funds in order that their buildings might be maintained. Just imagine going and asking thieves for the money to keep your church in order. And oh, listen, it has just become so commonplace, so commonplace. And then he tells us this, that there is committing adultery. 
or sorry, killing. I missed out the killing. How could I have done that? Killing. Yes, killing. And it's becoming more and more prevalent. And we have mentioned it before, and we must never deviate from it. The babies that are aborted are babies that are killed in the womb. And because that is being pushed, you mark my word, it will not be too long until they will be introducing what they like to term as mercy killing. Listen, whenever they're going to engage in a sinful act, they'll never call it what it really is. They'll invent a term for it, mercy killing. It's killing. And it can be institutionalized. And then you see, he says, adultery. Didn't need to say anything about that. My, this land is filthy with adultery. And you must never forget that God says that he hates this. And we might think it's no big deal. It doesn't really matter. But it is something that God loathes. And so these people, they have destroyed themselves They've destroyed themselves materially, economically. They've destroyed themselves morally. They've destroyed themselves spiritually. I'll go back into Hosea chapter 13. There are other verses that I could read. But it says, verse 1 of chapter 13, When Ephraim speak trembling, he exalted himself in Israel. But when he offended, offended in Baal or Baal, that's the false god that they worshipped. They had brought in their false god and they had begun to worship these false gods. And he says in verse 2, And now they sin more and more and have made them molten images of their silver and idols according to their own understanding. All of it the work of the craftsmen. Do you see what they did? They made gods of their own understanding. They jettisoned the God who had revealed himself to them and they just invented their gods out of their own imagination. Know how many gods there are that have been erected in this land. And the things that people will offer up and sacrifice to these gods, the gods of pleasure, the gods of sport, the gods of wealth, the gods of property and houses. My, they will sacrifice anything at the altars that they, those things might be had. So, These people, you see how they've destroyed themselves? And notice the prediction about this destruction. God says in verse 8 of chapter 13, I will meet these people as a bear that is bereaved of her whelps and will rend the call of their heart and there I will deliver them like a lion. The wild beast shall tear them. God says, listen, I am going to deal with you. And it is going to be a severe dealing with you. And you've brought it on yourself. And he says this, verse 16, Samaria shall become desolate, for she has rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword. Their infants shall be dashed in pieces. Their women with child shall be ripped up. They have set themselves on a course of sin that is going to bring tragic consequences. And who is responsible for this? Who is responsible for this destruction? You have destroyed yourselves. I said again, Britain, Ulster, you have destroyed yourself. Oh, that this could ring clear in the ears of people all around us and they would realize this. And why is this? That they have so destroyed themselves because they have rejected the knowledge that they had already received. I have touched on this already, but it is the case. Look at verse chapter 4, verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord is the controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. What? This people who had had the prophets, who had his word, and now God says there's no knowledge of God in the land? No, there's no knowledge of God in the land, he says. And he will go on and say, verse 6 of the same chapter, My people are, listen, destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. You've rejected knowledge. Have they not done that? 
rejected the knowledge that God has given to them. I've heard accounts in recent days of people with Bibles being given to them and the Bibles being thrown into their bins. I've heard accounts of people having Bibles given to their children and refusing to let their children have them. They have to get rid of them. And oh, you know, they're just pushing the Bible more and more and more away from them. In every realm and area of society, they simply do not want it. They do not want the knowledge of God. They've cast away the good that they possessed. He says that in chapter 3. He says, Israel shall cry unto me, my God, we know thee. And God responds, Israel hath cast off the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. And they've deliberately taken the good things that God has showered upon them. And they've just bundled them up and thrown them away from them and said, we do not want it. What a blessing to any nation are stable, secure families and marriages. And what has our nation done? Just torn it up and thrown it in the bin and made it to be an utterly meaningless thing that doesn't count. Do you think there won't be a price to pay for it? Of course there'll be a price to pay. And you know, they forgot God who helped them. Chapter 13 and verse 6. The Lord says, according to their pasture, so were they filled. They were filled, and their heart was exalted. Therefore have they forgotten me. They have forgotten me. The one who is indeed the one who had cared for you and get, done so, so much good for you. Has our nation forgotten God? Yes, they have forgotten God. They've forgotten him willfully. And you can see it in so many areas. Let me give you a simple illustration. Back during the Second World War, on a number of occasions, this nation was called to prayer by its political leaders. They wouldn't be able to do that now. And I wouldn't be going asking them to call a day of prayer political leaders. Do you know why? Because if they do that, they'll have to ask everybody who has any sort of God at all to go and pray to them. And I'm not going to encourage them to do that. But the point I'm making, back then, they were called to prayer on numerous occasions. And those in authority clearly and emphatically put it on record that they accounted the deliverances that came during that trying time to the intervention of God and his answer to prayer. Now listen. You watch Dad's army, and you see how the church is treated in Dad's army. The minister, an effeminate little bumbling weakling, and whenever it's said that they're going to have to go to church, well, it's all a bit of a laugh, or laughter, a bit of a mockery, and all the rest of it. And it's this subtle undermining, and it's trying to deny it, but it's even more than that. You can re watch some of the dramas. And whenever they do include it, that there has been the call to prayer, you'll have the main characters with some smart comments, oh, they're away to prayer, a lot of good, that'll do them, or something to that effect. And the history books are steadfastly endeavoring to expunge and erase the fact that this nation called on God for help in the past from the record books. And tell me, where has been the real cry? over these past 10 months for people to come and seek God in prayer. Oh, churches have paid lip service to it. They said we believe that God is the one who can help us. But where has there been, really, where has there been the real upsurge? Oh, you see, God has been forgotten. Very quickly, I'm going to draw to a conclusion. You see the tragedy of the condition. You see the responsibility for the condition. If I had to leave it at that, it would be hopeless, wouldn't it? But there's a remedy for the condition. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. And the one who is the helper tells them exactly what they have to do in chapter 14. 
And here is the remedy for this condition. It is found only in the Lord. It's found in him alone. And this Lord comes to this Israel and he says to him, first of all, return. You need to return to me. You need to acknowledge you've strayed from me. You need to return. Does our land need to return? Yes, our land needs to return. Do our churches need to return? Yes, emphatically, our churches need to return. Do individual Christians need to return? Yes. And what about the unsaved? It's not that you need to return. You need to come in the first place to him. The one that you've never known, come back to him. And you need to return. You need to repent. You acknowledge that you're return and that you've fallen by your own iniquity. All of this state that you're in, it's your own doing. It rests on your own shoulders. And God in his mercy even goes the second mile, as it were, here. He says, take you with your words. Turn to the Lord, say unto him, take away all iniquity. Oh, we want to be done with this sin which has so devastated us and wrecked such havoc. Oh, Lord, come and take away all of this iniquity. Deal with it, deal with it. And you know, there's only one means by which God will deal with iniquity, and that is whenever he does indeed bring us to that place where we trust his provided remedy, Jesus Christ, his Son, his Savior, his Redeemer. And oh, our nation needs to realize that. Now, the nation can't come as a nation to the Savior, but individually. We need a moving of God that he'll bring our nation individually before him to confess their iniquity and cry out to him to take it away from us. So you return, you repent, you're a lie. He says, take with your words, turn to the Lord, say unto him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. Oh God, we have nothing to claim, no merit to bring. We must come to you humbly and say, if you're going to receive us, it must be graciously. You're not giving us what we deserve, but giving us what we do not deserve. We come so humbly to him in our repentance. And then there must be this renouncing. And we say, I sure shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses. You see, these people have been looking to Egypt, to Syria, to other places to help them. And they say, we're not going to trust in anything else. We're announcing everything else and we're coming to you. And we're coming back to you, our God. Oh, be our deliverer, be our help, be our aid. What will be the result of this if we do so? Well, God uses a wonderful picture from agriculture. And he speaks, you see, of the people being like a tree. And he says, verse 4, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away. What a wonderful, wonderful statement. As these people who have been so wayward and have been destroying themselves will indeed respond and turn to me as I should. I will heal them from it all. And I will love them freely with such a wonderful love. And yes, I will indeed have my anger turned away from them. I but there's a Jew unto Israel, he shall grow as a lily, cast forth his roots as Lebanon, his branches shall spread, his beauty shall be as the olive tree. Listen, he says, I will come to them, and they're like a garden that's withered and shriveled. Everything is dried up and barren, and there's nothing beautiful or fruitful there, but I will be like the gentle Jew that comes, and I will restore them and refresh them and renew them and make them beautiful and fruitful and prosperous again if they will but turn to me. Is this not a beautiful picture? Do you not want this for our land? I long for this for our land. I cry to God for this for our land. Do you not want it for our churches? What about for yourself? Do you need it for yourself? And listen, I must just hit this as I conclude. He says in verse 8, Ephraim shall say, what have I to do anymore with idols? You see, back in chapter 4, verse 17, God had said with regard to Ephraim, listen, Ephraim is joined to idols. That is literally married to idols. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. 
That is literally, if you like, don't touch him, don't go near him. He'll contaminate you. He's so wedded, he's so glued to these idols and these sins. Don't touch him, lest he pollute you. But when God works this refreshing in Ephraim, what does Ephraim say? What have I to do anymore with idols? And finish with them. God is my God. God is my Savior. God is mine. The idols are gone. We need a prophetic voice. I said at the outset, I don't believe that I'm that voice. I'm just like the voice that cries in the wilderness. But I believe this is what we need. And it's time for people in this nation to get serious about how things really are. More serious than COVID. Because there's something more serious at the root of everything. Our sin, our rebellion, our jettisoning of God, our self-destruction. But thank God in him there still is hope. May God bless his word. We're going to listen and